every age has its architectural master problems. Those programs that attract not only the signal architectural talent of the age, but also in the direction of their tentacles seem to epitomize the civilizational ambitions of the entire culture. At one time in the West, that note of interest centered around the church, at another time the palace, at another time the town square and civic buildings. But in our culture, there's a good argument to be made that for some time now, the apogee of architectural ambition has centered around the museum. Explaining why this should be so is a complicated story that involves art, ambition, civic pride, money, snobbery, and many other edifying and some not so edifying impulses. Over luncheon today, the art historian Mar Marco Grassi will have something to say about the birth of the modern museum. Other participants will share their insights about different aspects of that giant question mark that is the contemporary art museum. But for now, it is simply worth reminding ourselves how recent a phenomenon is the art museum and what a change in the metabolism of our relationship with art, the modern museum, instigated and abetted. As Andre Malraux observed in the Voices of Silence, art museums have existed for barely 200 years. They bulked so large in the 19th century, said Malraux, and are so much a part of our lives today that we forget that they have imposed upon the spectator a wholly new attitude toward works of art, for they have tended, said Malraux, to estrange those works that they bring together from their original functions and to transform even portraits into pictures. Once a mere collection, Malraux noted, the art museum is by way of becoming a sort of shrine. The Austrian art historian Hans Zettelmeyer elaborated on this point when he wrote that regarded as a temple, the museum is not the temple of any particular god, but a pantheon of art in which the creations of the most varied epics and peoples are ranged next to one another with equal claims to our attention. For this to be possible, however, it was first necessary that the divinities for whom the works were created in the first place should themselves be undeified. Now, art has maintained a sort of sacral aura, but at the same time, it was detached from its original religious situation. With the evolution of the art museum, art itself became aestheticized, enjoyed primarily for its own sake, not as a marker of some transcendent reality. Now, it might seem odd to say that art was aestheticized, for we tend to think of those terms as being almost synonymous. But it was not always so. Indeed, it's worth reminding ourselves that the term aesthetic, in our sense, is a very recent coinage. It was coined by the German philosopher Alexander Baumgarten in the mid-18th century. Art, on the other hand, is of course much older, being coterminous with the birth of our humanity. Now, Malraux and Zettelmeyer were writing in the mid-20th century. They looked back to Romanticism and its heavy, quasi-religious investment in art to explain the character of the art museum. They both have a lot of pertinent things to say about museums and the evolution of our expectations for art. A critical point, however, is that our understanding of the vocation of the art museum is intimately tied up with our understanding of the vocation of art itself. And again, it's worth pausing to remind ourselves what fearsome changes have been visited upon that little word art over the course of the last century. That story would itself take a conference or maybe 10 conferences to tell in all its exotic detail. But for now, it is enough to note that the word art has degenerated into a kind of honorific that is bestowed or withheld for reasons that often have nothing to do with aesthetic quality or achievement. One need merely utter the names Matthew Barney, Jeff Koons, or Damien Hirst to appreciate how much our culture's understanding of art has changed. As I say, explaining that change 
is a tall order, far beyond our remit for this morning. But I think it is safe to say that we all know that American culture has undergone drastic changes over the last several decades. Perhaps no cultural institution, with the possible exception of the university, has changed more drastically in that time than the art museum. Forty years ago, the typical art museum was a staid and stately place. Its architecture, often neoclassical, tended to suggest grandeur and to elicit contemplation. Soaring columns and marble halls bespoke an opulence of purpose as well as material wealth. Even museums that departed from the neoclassical model, such as New York's Museum of Modern Art, strove to embody a dignified seriousness about the vocation of art. At that time, the museum was widely regarded as a temple of art, a special place set aside from the vicissitudes of the quotidian. The decibel level was low, decorum high, and crowds generally were sparse. In the culture at large, there was a broad agreement that the art museum had a twofold purpose. First, to preserve and exhibit objects of historical interest and commanding aesthetic achievement. And second, to nurture the public's direct experience of those objects. Art, not amenity, came first on the museum's menu. The seriousness of the art museum was a reflection of the seriousness of the art world. If some works of art were deliberately playful or even frivolous, art itself was entrusted with the important task of educating the imagination and helping to humanize and refine the emotions. Accordingly, the art museums were democratic, but not demotic institutions. They were open, but not necessarily accessible to all. The bounty they offered exacted the homage of informed interest as the price of participation. Accessibility was a privilege anyone could earn, not a right that everyone automatically enjoyed. Now, the 1960s put paid to all of that. <clears throat> there are a handful of holdouts, odd institutions here and there that cling stubbornly to the old ways. But the blockbuster mentality that began developing in the 1960s helped transform many art museums into all-purpose cultural emporia. Increasingly, success was measured by quantity, not quality, by the take at the box office rather than the bar of aesthetic discrimination. Indeed, as the egalitarian imperatives of the 60s insinuated themselves more and more thoroughly into the mainstream culture, the very ideal of aesthetic excellence came under fire. Critics castigated what they called the, quote, masterpiece mentality the retrograde idea that some objects exerted a greater claim on our attention than others. Adulation, not connoisseurship, was the order of the day. Many commentators, even many artists, rejected outright the pursuit of aesthetic excellence, which they repudiated as elitist. Others subordinated the aesthetic dimension of art to one or another political program or social obsession. Notoriety, not artistic accomplishment, became the chief goal of art, even as terms like challenging and transgressive took precedence over terms like beautiful and other traditional epithets in the lexicon of critical commendation. Art was still a talismanic necessity, the presence of which underwrote an institution's social pretensions as well as its tax-exempt status. But increasingly, art functioned more as a catalyst than an end in itself. One attraction among many, and not necessarily the most important attraction, the coffee bar or restaurant, the movie theater or gift store, the interactive computer center vied for attention. Art merely added the desired patina of cultural sophistication. The triumph of quantity over quality showed itself in other ways as well. It used to be that art museums were like oases, relatively few and far between. But in the 1960s, it became an article of faith in some quarters that anyone could be an artist. I think, for example, of Mr. John Hightower, uh, who briefly was the director of the Museum of Modern Art. In one memorable effusion, Mr. Hightower publicly delivered himself of the opinion mm -hmm. that, quote, I happen to think that everybody is an artist. 
It was our misfortune that many people seemed to have believed him. <laughs> Suddenly, there was a Niagara of new art clamoring for attention. Established art museums undertook ambitious building programs to house the stuff. Museumless towns and college campuses scurried to remedy their lack. When it came to anything that could be congregated under the banner of the arts, the watchword was more is better. Everywhere one looked, there was a new or greatly expanded museum or art center. No self-respecting population dared be without some visible, quote, commitment to the arts. But the curious logic that subordinated aesthetic uh, to political considerations also meant that while possessing a museum became a badge of social respectability, respectability itself had become a deeply suspect idea. Art museums are still monuments to civic pride and sometimes to civic co coffers, but the irony is that today, many museums extol values utterly at odds with the civilization that produced and that continues to sustain them. It is a very odd situation. On the one hand, museums everywhere seem determined to transform themselves into an extension of the entertainment and recreation industries. On the other hand, behind the coffee bars, video arcades and Matisse t-shirts, umbrellas and scarves, more and more museums are committing themselves to a radical revisionist program that would have us view all art through the lens of political, social, or environmental activism. The result is what we might call cappuccino radicalism. Some years ago, a writer for the New York Times greeted this transformation in enthusiastic terms, contrasting the dark times of the past when museums encouraged contemplation and existed primarily for elite visitors. Today, this writer noted, all that has changed. The age of museums, she wrote, is not to be confused with the age of art or the age of art appreciation. Much museum going is not about art at all. It's simply social, she, she wrote. It's entertainment, not enlightenment or inspiration. Now, I think that writer was correct in her diagnosis, if not in her enthusiasm, as Philippe de Montebello, from whom we'll hear more later today, wrote at the time, quote, the trouble is that works of art, for the most part, are not fun. In fact, they can be difficult, challenging, even provocative, and they don't yield their message in the blink of an eye, which is what is expected by people looking to have fun. Seriousness, uplift, knowledge, and naturally, pleasure are what art museums are meant to provide. Thus, quoth Montebello. The question is, do they still? We call this conference the future of permanence in an age of ephemera. Most of us, I suspect, continue to regard the art museum as an ally in the battle for permanence, a bastion against the corrosive claims of the ephemeral. Certainly, that accords with the traditional idea of the museum as a kind of temple of art. But I suspect we have witnessed uh, important convulsions, convolutions in that understanding. Indeed, it is, one, it is one of the reasons that we at the New Criterion were so interested in exploring the subject of the art museum and the contemporary world. For we sense that the museum, like so many other cultural institutions, is undergoing a process of mutation that may fundamentally alter its purpose. Many art museums may still look like the marmorial palaces of yore, but increasingly their goals are in tension with the calm solidity of their galleries and pavilions. <laughs> 